Larry, tell us a little bit about yourself in terms of how you got to be such an avid speaker <laughs> for, for African people. Well, I grew up here in Newark, New Jersey. I was actually uh, born in Washington, D.C., but as a baby, I was less than a year old, I was brought here to Newark. So I was uh, raised here in Newark, New Jersey. And uh, actually, from the spot that we're sitting, I live not too far away. Uh, the first few years of my life, till I was about four years old, I lived several blocks in that direction on Ridgewood and Avon uh, in Newark. And then after my father passed away when I was four, we moved up to uh, South 12th Street, which is about, about six or seven blocks up from here. And uh, so this is a community uh, that I grew up in and a community which I've seen transformed over the years. In some ways, the transformation has been good. In other ways, the transformation leaves much to be desired but I'm a product of Newark Public Schools, uh, South 17th Street School, kindergarten through eighth grade, one school, and then Arts High School, uh, four years, uh, which is just <laughs> about, we're kind of in the epicenter. Arts High School is literally about four blocks uh, down the hill here. So in terms of how I became uh, active in the movement uh, for, black freedom and liberation. I guess it, it, in one sense, it's rooted in where I grew up and how I grew up. I didn't come out of a real political family. I didn't come out of a family that was active either in the civil rights movement or really active in the black power movement here uh, in Newark, New Jersey. My folk were just regular working people. Uh, my father had been a truck driver. My mother was a seamstress. When my father passed, we went to live with my, my grandfather, and he was what people called then a boiler man. I don't know if you're familiar with that. In, in terms of when I became uh, politically conscious, first of all, I, I said that my family wasn't political, but they were not... Um, they were, I guess, and to some degree, politically progressive. You know, I didn't come out of a family where I heard a lot of negative talk about our people. In fact, to tell you the truth, I can't ever remember any negative talk about what then we called Negroes, you know, and colored. Because my folks were from, from Gainesville, Georgia, and those were the words that we used. We didn't start using black probably around till the late 1960s, probably uh, after the, the 67 rebellion, didn't start using the term African-American until the early 70s. So I guess if I was to point to a seminal event in, in the development of my political consciousness, it would have to be the uprising here in Newark in 1967, because up until that point, I lived uh, a fairly average life um, and really didn't have a lot of discussions about race or politics but the eruption the uprising the rebellion of 1967 forced my family to have discussions with me that I had not uh, had before because I said well why why is everybody so mad you know, because it was a summer night in July, July 12th. I was 12 years old in 1967. I had just graduated uh, eighth grade elementary school. I was, I was a turn 13 later on that fall. And I was at a little house party across the street with my friends. And somebody ran upstairs and said, is something going on on Springfield Avenue? And we started to all run down the stairs, and I started to go down 12th Street towards Springfield Avenue, because we lived on 12th Street. My mother was on the porch waiting for me. <laughs> Larry, get your butt over here and go upstairs. And she probably did well by that, because had I gone down on 12th Street, there's a possibility, I mean, had I gone down to Springfield Avenue, there's a possibility 
I might have lost my life or gotten hurt because uh, many people don't know that uh, 26 people uh, were killed during the uprising in 67. Uh, 1,500 people were injured. 1,500 people were injured. Shot by the police. Either shot or, or some injury related to the uprising, the, uh, uh, brutalized or whatever. Um, it was it was really something. So you know that that up which went on for five great five days. You know Newark had a police force at that time, probably somewhere between a thousand and fifteen hundred police. They couldn't stop the rebellion, and it was interesting because you know the first few days of the rebellion, because we could see it from my porch. I lived on the second floor, and when I say say see it, I don't mean see Springfield Avenue because the first night probably the rebellion was all here on Springfield Avenue but the nights after that the rebellion carried into the neighborhoods because back then Newark had a more decentralized economy each neighborhood had uh, grocery stores and vegetable stores and you know cleaners and oh each community had the things that it needed so to speak, within that community. I mean, 16th Avenue, which was, I lived on 12th Street between 16th Avenue and 18th Avenue. 16th Avenue looked very much like a smaller version of Springfield Avenue, all kind of stores, you know. So when the rebellion first erupted, it erupted here on Springfield Avenue because the police arrested a black cab driver named John Smith and they took Smith to the 17th Avenue precinct, which is one block over here. And that precinct had a terrible reputation. Black, it was said that some black people went in there alive and came out dead. And when Smith was taken to the police station, there were organizations here uh, active in Newark. Uh, one was a chapter of CORE and there were other organizations. They had a demonstration in front of the 17th Avenue precinct. They wanted Smith released because the rumor was that he was already dead. And there was a large gathering of people in front of, because see, all this area here used to be projects. You can't see any projects here now. They used to be 13 story, 13 story projects. Right here was Hayes Homes, and across the street was Scudder Homes. And behind um, Scudder Homes was Stella Wright. There were all kind of housing projects. At one time, it was said that Newark had more black people per square mile, that literally the central ward of Newark had more black people per square mile than any comparable size area in the United States because of these housing projects. So back in those days, it didn't take much to gather a crowd, because there were literally thousands of people. You know, you from New York, you know how these housing developments are. They're like small cities. Some of these housing developments have more people than, some, than many towns yeah. in, in America. So at that time, it didn't take much to get a crowd. So they had a large crowd, and of course, the police, the way they responded was to come out in mass and force, and a confrontation ensued between the police and the uh, protesters, and that is what led uh, to the explosion, to the rebellion, which lasted more than five days. Now, the first night, it was confined to certain areas of the city, like Springfield Avenue here, but then by the second night, it had kind of overflowed into communities. And of course, the rebellion did involve the looting of stores, but many stores were looted along here in Springfield Avenue, but then the second night, it involved the looting of stores in neighborhoods. And, and 16th Avenue, you know, was a main target because there were many stores there. But stores that were black owned, people, I don't know if they did it instinctively or if they were told to, they wrote Soul Brother on the store. So the stores that had Soul Brother on the window, you know how you can take that soap and write Soul right on the glass window? They wrote Soul Brother. Those stores were left alone. So for the first two nights, you know, it was almost, I hate to even use these words because sometimes I could be misconstrued. 
it was almost like a carnival-like atmosphere. You, I did not see, and I'm talking about now from my front porch, I did not see a whole lot of confrontation between the people and police. I have a suspicion that a lot of the police were called over into the north side of the city and the west side of the city and the east side of the city because these were where the white communities were. The black people were in the, the central ward and in the south ward. So we didn't see a whole lot of confrontation with the police. In fact, I'm going to tell you the truth, I didn't see any confrontation with the police. I saw confrontation between people like white people that were driving through our neighborhood, cars would be stopped. Sometimes, I, you know, I'm saying this at the risk of being criticized, but I saw cars being stoned. I'm, you know, that's what I saw. But those were very, there were very few incidents like that. You know, most of it involved like looting of stores and, you know, people wasn't running nowhere. They was just getting stuff and walking back to their homes. And, you know, by the second day, things had kind of calmed down. But, you know, it had become a national uh, a news item. And everybody, of course, was in an uproar. So at first, seeing that the Newark police couldn't put it down by themselves, uh, the, the mayor called on the governor for aid. Governor Hughes was the governor then. And he sent 700 state troopers to aid the police. And I believe it was those state troopers were the ones, maybe some of them, not all of them, the black stores that had Soul Brother written on them were shot into. And they were shot into by the police and by the state troopers and the National Guard. But the state, 700 state troopers combined with the Newark police force couldn't put down the rebellion. So ultimately, Governor Hughes declared martial law and called in, I believe it was about 1,500 National Guard. I could be wrong, could be, it wasn't a lesser number, it could have been a greater number, but at, least, at a minimum, I believe it was 1,500 National Guard and martial law. And this is why we call it a rebellion. How do you, how do you tell a rebellion from a riot? Well, one of the ways you tell a rebellion from a riot is how the uprising is quelled. If the uprising is quelled by the simple intervention of the police, then you probably had a riot. If you have to declare martial law, which is what is used in a wartime situation, and you have to call out armed forces, then you're dealing with a rebellion. And so martial law was declared a state of emergency and martial law was declared here in Newark. The National Guard were brought in. And, um, you know, this whole commotion it was, is what caused me to, to ask my family, you know, why were people so angry? Why was this happening? You know, and that is what really started my first, what I would say, it wouldn't be the absolutely first discussions about uh, race, but the first really serious discussions when my grandfather began to tell me about, the, you know, the first thing he told me, it wasn't even about how things were in the South because he was from Georgia. His first thing he started telling me about was his experience in the Army because he had been in the Army and he had been one of the black uh, divisions in one of the black divisions that had been deployed to France. And he told me how as soon as they got there, the French people were asking them to see their tails because the white soldiers had told the, the white French people the black people had tails. <laughs> you know, my mm -hmm. grandfather started telling me about this and started telling me about the treatment that he received while he was in the army. And then, of course, he started talking about the South. And my grandfather hated the South. My grandfather today is buried in the veterans section in a cemetery in Belleville, New Jersey, not far from here, because he told my mother that if she put his body on the train down south, that he would get up off the train and come back <laughs> and give her the what for, because he did not want nothing that he hated the south. My, my grandfather was a very uh, uh, African-looking black man, so I'm sure that he received, you know, the worst part of racial segregation uh, in the South. And uh, this is, this is, this I would say was the beginning 
of the opening up and, and the, the flowering of my political consciousness, you know, and the, dis the discussions, because those discussions started, and once those discussions started, they went on for a long time, because Newark was a long time in recovery, you know, and, the, and then, you know, after the uprising in Newark, you saw more programs and discussions on television about the race question as they called it back then, about race relations. And, and then my family, which hadn't been active in the civil rights movement, began to talk about uh, Martin Luther King and what he was doing and so on and so forth. So that, that, that's how, you know, that's the road, that's where I started down the road of, of struggle, so to speak. And then uh, my consciousness was further advanced as a student I was a student leader, uh, a student organizer when I, I was president of student government of my high school. And we had, I organized walkouts and even a sit-in uh, to improve conditions in my high school. At what, that, what were conditions like that you wanted to improve? Well, like uh, for instance, in, in newer classrooms were overcrowded, 30 and, and 40 students, you know, in a class. My school, Arts High School, which was supposed to be an advanced school academically, had no real gymnasium, had no athletic facilities, didn't even have adequate facilities in terms of it, what it was specialized in, music and art. And uh, we led a sit-in uh, during the time of the longest teacher strike here in the history, in the history of the United States, actually, it was the longest teacher strike in the history of the United States up until that time. And we had missed so many days that they told us if we missed 35 consecutive days of school, we wouldn't graduate. Now, all of us were seniors. We'd been accepted at colleges. We wanted to graduate. So I let a walk out of my school. We marched down on the Gateway Hotel, which is still there. That's the hotel across the street from Penn Station. And we sat in. As a result of that action, I met Kenneth Gibson, the first black mayor of Newark, who was elected after the rebellion. Uh, after the rebellion of 67. In fact, that summer, literally two weeks after uh, the rebellion, in the month of July, a Black Power Conference was held downtown Newark. And out of that Black Power Conference, a Black Power Convention was planned. That was held at that school. You can see it right here. See that school right there? That's West Kenny, not that bank building, but you see that long building behind there? Oh, yeah. That's a school, that's West Kenny Junior High School. That's where the Black Power Convention of 1968 was held. And then up the hill over in the South Ward is Clinton Place Junior High School. That's where the Black and Puerto Rican Convention of 1969 was held. And out of that convention of 69 came the community choice ticket with people like Ken Gibson, Sharp James, Councilman for, for Councilman South Ward, Dennis Westbrooks for councilmen of the Central Ward. They were on a, a, a whole slate of folks. All right, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. good. How you doing, sir? I'm doing well. Good to you see you. if I film, do you? No, 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 no. no. All right. No, they all grew up in the 70s. Yes, yes. So they over there celebrate. Yes. I told them I was going to back to Terry. Yes. I don't know nobody over there. <laughs> oh, all right. Okay. I come to show yes, sir. Don't they know don't even here. know us here, right? Yeah. So, what, what, let me ask you: Were there uh, many blacks in political? No, offices? no. Newark, no. Newark was an apartheid. Prior to the rebellion of 1967, Newark was an apartheid town. It had, mean? it had a, it had a majority black population, and had little or no black elected representation. Newark had been a majority black town for a long time, but it was a town in which redlining and segregation uh, took place. So even though it had a large black population, most of the black population was confined to the central ward and to the south ward. But in terms of raw numbers, black people by probably by the late 1950s were outnumbering white people. We didn't get our first black councilman here in Newark until 1960 with the election of Irvine Turner. This street back here, right here, the street going across this way, that's Irvine Turner Boulevard. 
It's named after Irvine Turner, who was um, the first black councilman uh, uh, here uh, in Newark. And there were no others elected until after the rebellion. Now, Ken Gibson, he had run for mayor the first time in 66, but he didn't make it. And even, even though we had the rebellion and the black consciousness movement of the 60s, he almost didn't make it in 69. Adonisio had been indicted, the mayor, was white, Italian. He had been indicted, but yet under indictment, he still took Gibson to the runoff. From the general election in May, there had to be a runoff in June of 1960, of, um, in June of 1970. And uh, uh, so we had a majority black population, a white power structure. What about the economy? Did blacks own much of the economy? Owned a little, but not much. I mean, there were, ironically, there might have been more black-owned stores and businesses then than there are now. And there wasn't a whole lot of them then. My, one of my uncles, Buddy Baker, my mother's sister's husband, he owned a barbecue store on uh, Clinton Avenue, Buddy's Barbecue on Clinton Avenue. And there were other black restaurants, uh, Arizona Inn and... Uh, there were a number of black-owned stores, but I wouldn't say it was the majority of the economy here. You know, a lot of the stores and shops were still in, up, up in the neighborhoods with many of them owned by um, Jewish uh, people. Uh, in fact, right down here, Prince Street uh, was where a lot of black people used to go shop. They didn't even go downtown because there was segregation downtown. Like if you went to Bamberger's at, at one point in the 50s and early 60s, you couldn't try on clothes in Bamberger's. You went to the hat store, you couldn't try on hat. You, if you didn't know the size, your exact size when you walked in there, you couldn't try on a hat because a white person wouldn't put on a hat that, that had been on a black person's head. There was segregated seating in the movie theaters down here. Black in people, Newark? yes, in Newark. Black people couldn't sit in the mezzanine. That's the, that's the main section on the ground level, black people had to sit in the balcony. This was in Newark. See, people think Jim Crow was only a Southern phenomenon. There was a lot of Jim Crow in the North, and it wasn't informal Jim Crow either. You'd be told, no, we don't serve black people here, or black people can't sit down here, they got to sit over there. All kind of stuff was going on. And, and this was one of the reasons, in addition to just the downright impoverished you know, like right in this area here used to be some of the worst housing in Newark. Like these projects here, these are new. These are new communities. And the uh, new community is an anti-poverty agency here in Newark. And these were built in the 70s. But this whole area here used to be like tenement, wood frame houses and slum living. Like even, even until the late 60s, a lot of homes didn't have hot water. They were cold, what they call cold water flats. And I, I can even remember when we lived on Ridgewood Avenue for, for a time that my mother had to heat the water. If you wanted hot water for a bath or hot water, you had to get, you had a little tub, right? A lot, you know, one of them little white tubs that they used to have. You fill the tub up with water and put it on the stove. And he, that's how, you, how we got hot water. This was in my lifetime. Now, I'm 62 now. But this was in my lifetime. I can remember this, this time. So there were very terrible conditions of impoverishment in Newark. And that was, that was the kindling for the, the, the spark. The, the spark was police brutality. The kindling would, anybody that's ever built a fire know you got to have kindling first. You got to have small stuff that'll catch fire real easy to light the larger stuff that you put on the fire. But the, these adverse conditions, that, impoverished conditions that our people lived in in the 60s. That was the, 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 the firewood uh, uh, for the uprising and the, and the spark, the flint was police brutality. And, and there had been a lot of it in Newark. I remember my own grandfather telling me when we started talking about race and he started talking about the police and how the police treat people. But one of the things he would always say, and I know people would find this ironic, and maybe even upset some people, but my grandfather used to tell me that the black cop will beat you harder than the white cop would. Because back then, 
to be a part of the police force, you had to prove yourself. You know, a lot of people don't even know that the first black police officers couldn't even arrest white people. Like, that was a rule. <laughs> that even, even in New York City, go back into the history of policing and the history of when they hired the first black cops, and you'll see that it was a rule. I don't know if it's a written rule or unspoken rule, but black cops could not arrest white people. Only later on did they start let, uh, letting black cops arrest white people. They could only arrest black people, you know, but police brutality was a fact of life in those days, and the police were very brutal. And today, you know, we see many of these cases of police brutality because of the media, because of the regular commercial media, now because of the social media, we, we see it all over. It was all over back then, but we didn't have the, the, the commercial media that we have today. You know, and we, we didn't have an environment where even if you talked about it, people would believe it. Even black people wouldn't believe, you know, how much police brutality was, was going on. And, and there was kind of a, a kind of thinking, well, if the police beat you, probably deserved it, you know? But now we see, because of the movements against police brutality since the 60s on, the, on through, because the, the demand for a police review board came up in this town as early as 1964, you know? Uh, and it took a half century to, to get the first, we're gonna have a police review board in Newark with the, uh, since the election of Mayor Baraka he signed the executive order to create it. A year later, the city council approved the, the city ordinance to establish it. So we're gonna have our first police review board uh, probably up and running, probably before this year is out. Now, we talked about education, but how did education factor in, especially in terms of the school? Well, education, Education was one of the battlegrounds. See, there were, there were some fights that went down before the, the rebellion broke up and were related to the rebellion. You know, the, the, the demand for community control. When, 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 when I became a member of the Newark Board of Education at the age of 17, I was appointed right at, shortly after a sit-in that we had the mayor asked me if I wanted to be a board member. And wasn't a student board member. I was one of the nine voting board members. I was 17. I wasn't even old enough to vote yet. And um, one of the big, when I became a member of the board, one of the organizations that existed was called ONE, the Organization of Negro Educators. And it was established to pressure the Board of Education in Newark to hire more black teachers and administrators. Now this was a majority black city. I'm almost certain that by 19, probably by as early as probably 1964, 65, the school population of Newark was probably majority black. But there were hardly any black teachers. For instance, I went to South 17th Street School from kindergarten through eighth grade the only black teacher I had was my speech therapist because I had to have speech therapy when I was a kid because I spoke with a pronounced lip, lisp. I had a speech impediment. And she came around twice a month. All my other teachers, my homeroom teachers, reading, math, all my teachers were white. And this was a school smack dab in the heart of the black community, South 17th Street School. So there were no black teachers, there were hardly any black teachers, hardly any black administrators. Uh, there, was, there probably wasn't anything that we would call community control. So all of these demands began to come up in the 60s for more black teachers, more black administrators for community control. So a lot of these schools became battleground. In fact, a lot of the school struggles are where some of the activists uh, that later on became elected officials. Uh, came out of those struggles. One of the major struggles that preceded the uprising of, of 1967 was the Wilbur Parker affair. 
Wilbur Parker was a black man, an African American, who was the first certified public accountant in the state of New Jersey. He was in line to become what was called the secretary of the Newark Board of Education. The, the current secretary at that time uh, in the early 70s, 1970, was a fellow named Arnold Hess, who I'm told who'd never gone to college, much less been a certified accountant, because the secretary of the board is the person that managed the finances for the school system. And Parker had been in line for that job, and the board had denied Parker that job, and that had the black community in an uproar. That was, one of, that was one of the first affairs. The next affair that kind of set the stage for the rebellion of 67 was the construction of University of Medicine and Dentistry, which is right over there. You can almost see it from here. If, if these trees weren't here, you could see uh, some of the buildings, University of Medicine and Dentistry. It did not exist prior to 1967 and they wanted to build it here in Newark. They picked the, the heart of the black community in the Central Ward. At first they wanted five to six acres and they wanted to clear out that whole section of Central Ward. And many people speculate that Adonisio wanted to do that in order to dilute the voting strength of the black community. Because the five or six acres is a lot of land in a city, especially when you're talking about a, a densely populated city. And so there was a major struggle uh, over the building of the medical school in the Central Ward, in the heart of the Central Ward. Eventually a compromise was reached and it, it, it went down from five or six acres to one and a half acres and then they had to sign like an agreement with the community of uh, what the, the school was going to do in terms of uh, admitting black students and providing health services to the black community and so on and so forth. One of the people that were involved in that struggle, that was involved in that struggle, still around, Junius Williams. He was the one that was one of the negotiators of the agreement around the School of uh, Medicine and Dentistry. So there was the Park Affair, there was the, the University of Medicine and Dentistry Affair, even Essex County College, you, you can't see it from here but there was a big struggle over the construction of Essex County College here in Newark. They wanted to build a new Essex County College, which was down on Clinton Street, and they wanted to put it up in um, Caldwell, which is a white suburb, which is still a white suburb in the 21st century, predominantly white suburb, uh, two or three cities over. You know, they wanted to put it in Caldwell, so there was a big struggle and the community, I guess you could say, had a victory because today that, that school has been there since uh, the mid-1970s, the new Essex, well, at that time, 1970s, the new Essex County College. But these are some of the struggles that preceded and kind of set the stage for the rebellion, the struggle for community control of school, hiring of, of uh, uh, black uh, teachers and administrators. That, and you know, even after the rebellion, after the election of Ken Gibson, the struggle for community control of schools was still a major struggle uh, in this city. Let me, let me ask you, what impact did the national struggle with King, Carmichael, you know, all of the different movements well, coming together, the, how did that the, the national and international struggles, I guess you could say, was sim. How can I say this? The the intersection of the national and international struggles with the struggle here in Newark came together in one man, and that man was Amiri Baraka. And in the 1970s, he was known as Imamu Amiri Baraka. And he had a local organization that was called the Congress of Africa, uh, was called the Committee for Unified Newark. And that local organization was part of a national organization called the Congress of African People. And really, Amiri Baraka is probably the major 
figure, if, if, if people call me a political activist today, it's in large part because of Amiri Baraka. Because he was literally right here in this community. His headquarters, what people call 502 High Street, but what, what was formerly known as the Hikalu Umoja, the House of Unity, was right down here on High Street, uh, what then called High Street, now today called Martin Luther King Boulevard. And it was one block from my high school, so I had to pass that building every day and see those brothers dressed in African clothes every day and hear that African music every day. And then Baraka had a second headquarters, which was literally two blocks over here on uh, what was then Belmont Avenue, which is today called Urban Turner Boulevard. That was the Hikalu Imwalimu, the temple of the teacher. The house, the Imwalimu is teacher in Swahili. And um, Baraka used to have soul session there every Sunday. And after I was appointed to the board in 1971, I used to go, Barack invited me, and I used to go. At first, I went by invitation, and then I'd just go on my own to soul session every Sunday. And that's where Baraka would speak and connect the issues that we were struggling around here in Newark to the national struggle and the international struggle. And I also have to backtrack a minute and say Amiri Baraka was was probably the key leader of the black power movement in this town. And he and his organization, the Committee for Unified Newark, played a major role in the election of Kenneth Gibson as the first African-American mayor here in the city of Newark. One of the things I noticed on that spot, that moment, mm -hmm. there are a number of people, quite a number of I didn't know that many sisters were killed. Yes, yes. It. Well, they were killed because there's a, there's a book I would refer to called No Cause for Indictment by Ron Parambo. And Parambo talks about the deaths of these people in that book and the fact that no one was ever indicted for their deaths after it had been revealed that these people were not killed by snipers, as the police alleged, but as the medical examiner pointed out, the bullets that he extracted had to be bullets from the arms, the firearms of the state troopers, the local police, and the National Guard. Most of these people were killed, according to the medical examiner, examiner by bullets that came out of those firearms. Because sometimes they were firing, just firing right into the projects. Just firing, just shooting into the projects. They would say, oh, there's a snipe up there. And then everybody would point their rifles in that direction and start firing. Whether there was a sniper really there or not. And then with all that firing going on, bullets ricocheting, they thinking people are firing back. So yes, many women, many of these who were killed in the uprising were women. Uh, and, and, and some of their family, when we have the observance every summer on July 12th, People's Organization for Progress, since the founding of our organization 33 years ago, we have had an annual observance of the Newark Rebellion. Um, some of the family members come back who were in the house when their mother was killed. Mm. You know, in the house when their brother was killed, when the bullets came through. You know, and yes, there were many women that, that many of those that are on that monument are women, and it's, it's very unfortunate. But you know, one of the things I want to say uh, is that Newark was not the only city to have a rebellion. 123. Yes. Between 1960 and 1972, there were more than 1,000 urban uprisings in the United States of America. Many people don't know that. There used to be a term 
that uh, Baraka and his organization would use for people uh, who had a certain perspective on the revolution, they called it right around the cornerism. That many people believed that the revolution had been right was going to take place very soon in America, but there was a there was a material basis. Maybe if they were not right in that belief, they had there was a material basis for the speculation because there had been so many urban uproars. That's one of the best kept secrets of the city. People remember the Detroit uprising, L.A. uprising, New York uprising, Newark uprising. But they only have memory of a handful of uprisings. But the reality was that there were more than 1,000 urban uprisings in the United States between 1960 and 1972. The last uprising in Jersey was in Camden. And I believe that was in 1971. You know, these Newark wasn't even the first one in New Jersey. Actually, Jersey City happened before uh, Newark. The stop for me. So one of the things that I would advise, and you should always take my advice with a grain of salt, but one of the things I would advise is for black communities all across the United States to have observances of these rebellions. This is a part of our struggle that some people want us to forget about and other people would outright erase from history if they could. See, when people think of the black struggle, and they do rightly, they think of the civil rights movement. That was one of the major parts of the black struggle. But there was another part of the black struggle, and that was the mass resistance. And that part is hardly ever talked about. And quite frankly, I think that they don't want people to talk about it because they don't want any more uprising. See, one of the, the most effective ways to oppress a people is to erase their memory. If you don't have a memory of your history, you really don't have a memory of your oppression. And if you don't have a memory of your oppression, you don't have an idea that there's anything you need to be struggling against, that you don't even have an idea that you're part of some type of historical struggle. It's just like, you know, when, when people talk about black history, they talk about, like they teach our kids about slavery in school, but they don't teach our kids about the resistance to slavery. Herbert Aptecker in his book, Slave Rebellions in Colonial America, points out that there were at least 400 recorded, now this is recorded, slave rebellions in the colonies in the U.S. colonies, I'm not talking about in the Caribbean, in the U.S. colonies, that it wasn't just the Nat Turner Rebellion or the Gabriel Prosser Rebellion. There were many more, many, many rebellions. And see, that's a part of history that's left out because quite frankly, people would like to revise history to make people believe that social change only comes about through the ballot box. Now, does the ballot box bring, out, bring about social change? Yes, sometimes it does. But usually preceding uh, the use of the ballot is a struggle that goes on in the streets. And the, the ballot casting of ballots is the culmination of a struggle that began long before. So people want to revise history to, to, make, it, to make it sanitary, to make it acceptable, to make it you know, all, you know, we got all these things without any type of struggle or any type of violence. But the historical record shows something quite different. So that's why, like the People's Organization for Progress this month, in fact, in two weeks, we will have our annual, rebe our annual observance of the Nat Turner Slave Rebellion. We have a park in Newark named after Nat Turner. And we have an observance. The People's Organization for Progress 
has an observance of the Nat Turner Rebellion. And we have an annual observance of the Newark Uprising of 1967. And I would urge all of the activist organizations, especially the black, African-American, African, whatever term you want to use, organizations to have observances to talk about this history of urban struggle, to talk about these uprisings and how people, and, and how it happened, how it manifested itself in the community in which you live and what happened as a result of that. Many people don't know, Harlem had a couple of uprisings. I think the last uprising in Harlem was the, the, the uprising of 19, uh, what was that, 64. Because I think Malcolm X talks about, he says he was in Africa at the time that Harlem had a, a, an uprising. I believe it was in the summer of uh, 1964, maybe in 63, 63, 64. But, you know, a lot of what we call the black power movement was in fact stimulated by these urban uprisings, one would, one would have to speculate. There'd have to be some serious discussion as to whether or not Ken Gibson would have won the election of 1970 had he not, had there not been an uprising in 1967. He ran in 66 and lost. And the mayor, Adonisio, was under indictment and took him to the runoff. I dare say, had there not been an uprising and a leap in people's consciousness that came about as a result of that uprising, that maybe Gibson would not have been elected in 70. Maybe it would have happened later on in 1974, or maybe even later than that, because it, it, it took uh, 1970 to get the black mayor, but we didn't get the council. We only got three people on the council in uh, 70. The council remained majority white. Even though we had a black mayor, the council remained majority white from 70 to 74. It wasn't until 74 that we got a predominantly black city council. So I believe, this is my belief, that the uprising caused a leap in people's consciousness and, 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 and brought a lot of people because I'm going to tell you, you can go back to the record. You can go back and look at the Star Ledger from uh, the 1969 election, 1970 election. Look at the Newark Evening News, which is not published anymore. And you'll find that there were black people campaigning for Adonisio. There, that there are black people that voted for Adonisio. There were probably black people that voted for Adonisio in the runoff. You know, because they were part of the party machine. Irvine Turner was part of that party machine. Even though he was the first uh, black councilman, he was part of that Adonisio machine. You know, the, the drive for self-determination and independence was pushed forward as a result. Yes, the rebellion left a lot of destruction in its wake. It did. I mean, I can remember walking down Springfield Avenue a couple of days after the rebellion, and you could still smell the burning of, of, of the buildings in the air. There, you, you literally, there was nowhere you could step that there wasn't broken glass. Yes, it did take Newark years to recover from that economically, but at the same time, that rebellion brought about a transformation in black people's consciousness, and it let the power structure here in this city know, and it let the power structure in this country know that black folks just wasn't going to sit back and take it anymore. They weren't going to suffer in silence as we had been suffering uh, for decades. Larry, I just want to ask you to come in one other question. Uh, and that's the King Avenue plan. That's the King Avenue plan. After the rebellion, a plan to build the Negroes was yes. put in place. Yes. Can you talk about it? I have a vague recollection of the King Alfred plan, but I do know that actually prior to the 67 rebellion, because the rebellions, these uprisings had been occurring for some time. Actually, you would have to take it all the way back 
maybe even back further than that, but I can't speak to it specifically, but you'd have to take it back to the Roosevelt administration when legislation was passed to allow the construction of internment camps for the Japanese. That's one of the nodal points of, of the development of a counterinsurgency effort, because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about insurgency, uprisings, and we're talking about counterinsurgency. And the idea that you would have to have the wholesale roundup and lockup of people, numbers of people too large for jails to accommodate, and that you would have to establish certain types of camps for people to be in. As, as Roosevelt, who is fondly remembered by many <laughs> for the New Deal, but people seem to overlook that it was Roosevelt that signed the legislation that actually allowed for and enable the uh, internment of Japanese American Japanese people born and raised in this country, homeowners, business owners, allowed for their wholesale roundup and internment in concentration camps in America. So there was legislation that was signed then. I believe there was legislation signed again under Eisenhower for the establishment of such camps. And there used to be a group called the Black People's Topographical Center. Their building used to be literally right there where the Social Security building is. That's Social, where that's Social, Security, that's Social Security Administration building. Before that, there was a, a line of uh, wood frame houses there and there was a storefront and the name on that storefront was the Black People's Topographical and Research Center. And the people in the top, the black, black people in the top, would take you on a tour. And they, you know what topography is, it's map making. And they would take you on a tour of all these large maps that they had in different rooms. And they would show you where the concentrations of black uh, communities were throughout the United States. And then they'd take you through another room and show you where all the interstate highways were being built and how 280, which was being construction, constructed, came through the black community. That's on the west side of Newark. And how 78, which is on the south side, runs right through the black community, the south side of Newark. How these highways were being constructed to enable the, to facilitate the quick movement of military vehicles into black communities. And this is no joke because I can remember, I can show you pictures. We can go to, but we don't even have to go to like microfilm and microfiche and all of that. We could go right to the internet and see pictures of tanks rolling down the streets of Newark in 1967. Your tanks, like real tanks with the, with the, with the um, cannon on it and what they call half tracks, these little tanks. Uh, which were one and two man vehicles. They were all over here. I saw them with my own eyes, you know, in 1967. And this was a military occupation. That's how you know you have a rebellion. If you need the army to come in and put it down, that's a rebellion, it's not a riot. A riot is put down by your local police. A rebellion is when you have to declare martial law, which is the suspension of civil law, you have to declare martial law, the suspension of civil law, and you have to use army to come in. Remember in Detroit, which happened right after um, um, Newark, it happened the next month. Newark was July, Detroit was August. They not only called in the National Guard. In, in, Detroit, in Newark, we had the police, the state troopers, and the National Guard. In Detroit, they had the police, the state troopers, the National Guard, and the 82nd Airborne. The same 82nd Airborne division that was being used in Vietnam had to be deployed into Detroit to put down the Detroit Rebellion. You know, and, and this is a part of history that should not be lost, must be taught, must be transferred from generation to generation in order for our children and our future generations to know 
the intensity of this struggle. See, if, if you just take the history of the civil rights movement, you'll be looking at mostly the South because that's mostly where the civil rights movement was. It was in the South, Dr. King's, all of his major campaigns, except when he went to Chicago. And it was funny because Dr. King said he never saw racism down South like he saw in Chicago because the people in Chicago came out with Nazi flags and everything, you know. And they tried to stone Dr. King to death in Chicago. Um, but this is a part of our history that has to be taught because this was, it, this was national. This was in every major city in the North and the West, and everywhere else. Have, have those uh, laws been rescinded? No. Uh, they still on the No. Coast? So they can do the same thing? Brother, I'm telling you, and this is no secret, I have read it even in the Star Ledger which is the regular newspaper here that American troops have been training for some years now to be deployed in the event of urban uprisings. See, the, the, there's the propaganda that the government puts out, and then there's the propaganda, and th there's the propaganda the government puts out, and then there's the reality that you can discern from what they do. They come to the convention, they make these speeches about we all Americans and there's no red America, no blue, there's only America, you know. Meanwhile, in Arizona, the US Army is having exercises to put down anticipated uprisings in American cities because conditions are so bad. They know conditions are bad, we know conditions are bad. And they know that at a certain point, human beings will rebel. And it won't be anything caused by ISIS or anybody else. It'll be a, the oppression that people experience in, this, in their own communities that cause these uprisings. Do you know if, if prison camps have really been constructed to house? There are, they call them FEMA camps. FEMA. The Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA. FEMA has camps already. And they have camps ready to take people in the event that that has to happen. Right now, one of the, uh, let me go back a little bit. After I finished on the Board of Education, I went back to school, I went back to Princeton. That's where I was, that's where I had been accepted as a student at Princeton University, in one of the first politics courses I took at Princeton. Now this was in 1974 when I went back. I had to read a book titled No Left Turns. I can't remember the author of the book, but I read this book in 1974. That had to be, what, 35 years ago, maybe more than that. In this book, No Left Turns, the author pointed out that the FBI had a list of 15,000 people that will be detained immediately should the president declare a state of national emergency. Now that was in 74. Now since 74, we've had the Anti-Terrorism Act passed under Bill Clinton. We had the Patriot Act under George Bush, Patriot Act I, Patriot Act II. We had the um, uh, Defense Reauthorization Act passed under Obama. Uh, all of these things circumscribe and trump the civil liberties that are supposed to be guaranteed us by the Constitution. So you can believe it, if they had 15,000 people that they will detain automatically, you can imagine what that number will be now. And yes, there is legislation that will enable the establishment of internment camps for certain communities or, 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 or communities of people you know, should a state of national emergency be declared for, rel for 
reasons relevant to what we're talking about now. For an example, the shooting in Dallas with five Houston. Yes, but they, but it, but a national state of emergency wasn't declared. Not a national state. The mayor may have made some declaration, but there's a there's a declaration. There's a difference between what a mayor can declare, what a governor can declare, what the president can declare. And and these moves will be made in the event that the president declares a national state of emergency. But people should research this and not take not take my word for it, because I stand by everything I said. But you know now we have the internet, and it's very simple to go and uh, Google uh, FEMA camps, uh, internment camps, you know, uh, counterinsurgency uh, policies of the United States government. It's, it's all there. It's all on record. These are just things that are not talked about <laughs> because they don't want they don't want people to know. Essentially. Is there anything you would like to say to the general audience in regard to what we've been talking about and what, what, what we should be doing? Well, in a word, the struggle continues. Uh, we stand here at this monument today uh, as a result of a, an uprising that took place uh, more than well, almost next year will be the 50th anniversary. 17 will be 50 years since 1967. And in 50 years, brother, we've seen a little progress. We've seen a little progress, but for the most part, the masses of our people are still oppressed. The masses of black people are still oppressed in this country. And in fact, some of the indices of racial inequality are greater today than they were in 1967 when black people rose up. For instance, there are twice as many black people living in poverty today than there was in 1967. There are twice as many people unemployed today as there were in 1967. There's more, actually, America is a more segregated nation in many respects today since Jim Crow segregation was abolished with the passage of the Civil Rights Act. We don't have laws on the books anymore that says whites here and blacks there. But right now, our schools are more segregated today than they were 50 years ago. In fact, New Jersey, the state we're in here, is about the fifth or sixth most segregated school, most segregated state in the country. We are more segregated than some states in the South, right here in New Jersey. So our fight continues, and um, we have to take a stand. We have to take a stand for future generations. And we need to be confronting this system as energetically, even more energetically, than our people confronted this system during the 1960s. Nothing less than that is going to bring about any real change. We must be organized, we must be mobilized, and we must be ready to make sacrifices if we are called upon to do so. Nothing less than that is going to bring about the changes that we need. 